vanquisher of the Hawkins papers and the least mean person in gaming, Catobin. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to say a thing. You're I'm supposed to say something. It, like, it, yeah. So Huzzah I'm saying a thing so that it's Aaron Go Down with the hated Hawkins British. Papers. Just anything that pops to mind. <laughs> uh, prolific master of real-time research known for such game products as Cthulhu City, Eyes of the Stone Thief, and the difficult half of the Dracula dossier, authors of the novels The Gutter Prayer and The Shadow Saint, it's Gaelic Mensch, Gareth Hanrahan. <laughs> oh. Co-author of Swords of the Serpentine, writer of the Dungeonomics column at Critical Hits, Emily Dresner. Oh. Hey, folks. Co-author of Swords of the Serpentine, creator of Pelgrane's Time Watch and Owl Who Trail, nap expert, Kevin Culp. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Certified napologist. That's even funnier. I mean, that is right. Uh, oh. He's not here. Still living that 80s goth music life he was not alive for, PhD candidate and publishing amanuensis, Noah Lloyd, everybody. Give it up for Noah. Hey, everybody. And... Becky is not here. Becky's not here, and we don't have an interaction. Uh, an introduction for Rob. How fascinating! What? Why not? Oh, there we are. There we are. All right. You, well, Designer I mean, so, of 13th like Age, you, Dungeons yeah. and Dragons 14th Edition, and Wrestle Nomicon Raconteur Extraordinaire, Rob Hanso, also known as Varzor, not a troll. Varzor, <laughs> kind of a troll. All right. <sighs> And somewhere in the teeming masses, we don't know. Oh, there he is. I see him. I see him. He has the tasteful background of bookcases, the only good background. RPG writer since the 80s, contributor to Pelgrane's Dying Earth line, designer of the small folk, and here to tell us about the upcoming Lunar Society supplement for Trail of Cthulhu, it's Phil Masters. <sighs> Phil down there. Yeah. And it looks like we have Simon. Do we have Simon's do we? Do we? Yep, we should do. I see Simon's iPhone. In that Simon's case, iPhone is there, so I'm that assuming case, that that is Simon Rogers. But, but, but it's not, we don't physically see Simon. Hey, and Robin just showed up. Yeah, That's odd. I do see okay, Simon. Okay, Ken. All right. They must <laughs> right. have just got the Hyperloop in Canada, everybody. <laughs> Yes, um, the, 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 the proud possessor of the first fiber optic cable to be strung into the remote icy town of Toronto is the beloved creator of the gumshoe engine, Robin Delos. Where is Robin? <laughs> Where is Robin? Robin? Robin is connecting to audio. Okay. And now I muted. And now okay. muted. Well, I'm trying to unmute start. him, but I can't see him on the. But ways. I don't know if he heard the intro. He's listening to Pelgrim Press. All he right. missed it. All he right. missed uh -huh. it. I see. There we go. And we have another Canadian in the audience. Unmute. Someone disputing so my characterization of Toronto. It's icy in character. <laughs> yeah. So there's Robin. Oh, there's Simon oh, as well. Simon, right? finally. Wow. Co owner and vaguely reassuring ceremonial figurehead of Pelgrim Press, producer of such games as Trail of Cthulhu, Esoterrorists, and Knights Black Agents, enemy of squirrels everywhere. Simon Rogers. And we have Stephen Hammond with the Aurora Borealis tastefully whirling above his head, but I don't have his bio in front of me. Who do I ignore uh, why? We just have to uh, his bio love Stephen Hammond there. for what he's worth. Uh, oh, no, there it is. Maker yeah. of tabletop gaming apps, including Gumshoe's Character Tool, The Black Book, version two of which launches tomorrow. Give it up for Stephen Hammond. Great. And I, of course, am the beloved Luminary of Gaming, creator of The Fall of Delta Green, Knights Black Agents, Trail of Cthulhu, and Day After Ragnarok, podcaster and honorary Torontonian, Kenneth Height. Yay! Yeah. All right, so that's, that's the intros. Uh, and I assume we now turn it over to Kat to... Uh, say what we're doing right or do we turn it back over to robin now that he's here robin to robin because robin is like the he is the the, the mensch of the panel so right. he's, he knows what's going on Gar's, a, Gar's sitting right there how dare you how very dare you this is, 
considering this payback for like Gar getting to be called like the Gaelic mention, like no mention of me being Gaelic in any sort of way. Well, well goodness, you, if you, only, you if only the person who wrote that intro was here to be criticized, yeah, but I think they're still both. hung up in the frickin' Ithaqua land. You can't be both the least mean person in gaming and the Gaelic mensch. There's, there's, there's separate categories. Um, so uh, we are all here to talk about what's up with Pellegrin Press. Uh, there's uh, lots of uh, stuff uh, both on the agenda and uh, recently uh, released. If uh, we were actually at the uh, Crown Plaza, uh, we would be able to direct you back to the uh, exhibit hall uh, where you would uh, pick up uh, your uh, 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 exciting uh, four for three deal. But Kat, why don't you tell them that the four for three deal lives on even though Gen Con is but virtual. It does. Um, so basically one of we, when COVID apocalypse happened and everything went into lockdown, we reached out to the community. And I think I know a lot of people who are um, here in the chat with us um, were people who responded. And we kind of said, what, what can we do for you in these crazy end times? Um, and one of the things that people said um, was that they really were going to miss the convention for three author. So we were like, okay, well, you know, we can, we can fix that for you. Um, so we sent the convention for three offer on the web store as it is at the moment. So you can, um, I cleverly did not think to have the voucher code up. So, um, so the voucher code is, I think, COVID at four four three. Um, but I will double check that, and I will post. I will post the four four three voucher code in the chat. Uh, so, Kat, if this was uh, an actual Gen Con, what exciting recently released products? Uh, would people uh, be able to go and uh, use their uh, extending four for three money on? So the most recently, uh, hmm, okay, the most recently proper released thing that people could get an actual print book on. Uh, <laughs> see, you can't do that as Jenka. Um, <laughs> is Moon City Blues. So I think that'll be over to Gar and to you to talk about. Um, so, uh, Gar, you uh, took first edition uh, Mutant City Blues and uh, uh, jazzed it up uh, for uh, a uh, exciting new version, which has a beautiful Jean Ha cover on it that I think more precisely communicates that it is our uh, superhero pro police procedural game. Uh, and uh, it's a uh, a great cover and full of Easter eggs as well. Uh, but uh, Gar, can you uh, tell people um, what to uh, expect in uh, this latest edition of Mutant City Blues? I can. Um, the game itself is uh, updated, tweaked. We've uh, basically addressed various concerns that were raised with the first edition, uh, made some minor mechanical changes. And there is a new section in there on uh, playing private detectives instead of so if you want to play basically Jessica Jones instead of Super Police, that's in there. Um, there uh, are some mechanical tweaks. We moved to um, a more sort of Yellow King-esque uh, pushes approach for spends. And there's a new adventure in there. That's all been polished and as I said, jazzed up for the modern day. And Given the it starts with a mysterious plague sweeping the world, it's even more topical than before. Well, it's not like the mysterious plague starts in January. That's that's not a thing. That's exactly a thing. Um, right. Um, so for those uh, Mutant City Blues, when it originally came out, as sort of the gumshoe game that kind of fell between the original release of Esoteris and Fear Itself, and uh, and uh, I don't know if it was literally uh, before Trail, it might have been just after Trail, but it was sort of the one that. Uh, the big spike in awareness around Gumshoe had not quite happened yet. So some people even who know other Pelgrain uh, games and who know um, uh, other Gumshoe games may not be familiar with the premise. And as I said, it is the superhero police procedural game. And the basic premise is that uh, this is a world where all of the superpowers, all the mutant abilities, all stem from one source, from the sudden mutation. 
participation event, which Gar was alluding to. And it is long enough since those became part of society that forensics exist in order to uh, explain uh, and study what they are. And uh, the uh, relationship between the different powers on the altered genome has also been mapped in what is called the Quaid diagram. And that is both a world artifact that your uh, investigators, whether they're police or private eyes, uh, will use, uh, and, but also part of character generation so that you pick powers that are close together on that relationship map. And the further apart you go, the more they start to cost. And so uh, if you're looking at a, a crime scene and you realize that there is uh, both traces that someone used uh, webbing and also a mutant fire, uh, and you can tell mutant fire from regular fire because science, uh, that you know that you've, you're dealing at least with two uh, different perpetrators with mutant powers because those two things are too far away uh, on the Quaid diagram. And the idea is, is that it would be difficult to do uh, not an investigative game per se, but one that's specifically uh, also a police procedural in a crazy world like uh, the DC universe or the Marvel universe where anything can happen uh, and any effect can be generated, but maybe it was a robot, maybe it was a celestial, maybe it was someone from an alternate dimension, or maybe it was a, a, a gadget. We don't know where, where, the, where it came from, but in um, this world, uh, these abilities are known and studied and they're also uh, part of the legal system so that uh, the, uh, if someone uh, did something against their will as a result of a, uh, some sort of psychic effect, there's a test that you can do for that. And of course, you don't go for, to jail if a mind controlling mutant uh, did something because you can show them the blood sample. We can see that you're not uh, culpable uh, for that. Um, so that's Meet in City Blues. Uh, what else might be at this uh, uh, color grain press uh, table that we're imagining, Kat? So other things that um, would not actually be at the table, except, well, they might be there in a, a kind of a, a hip um, Ashcan variant like the kids are doing, um, would be uh, Swords of the Serpentine. Just over to Kevin and Emily. Sure. So Swords of the Serpentine is a fantasy gumshoe taking a original sword and sorcery approach to it um, with a spectacular setting by Emily Dresner over to my right. There she is. Uh, primarily, there's a few interesting things we do with the rules, including adding morale-based combat alongside of health-based combat so you can defeat your enemies uh, with, uh, with fear or or persuasion or threats or what have you. Really, it is very satisfying to leave uh, the bad guy kneeling on the ground in front of you, weeping, regretting their life choices instead of necessarily dead. Um, the combat system is, uh, is altered so that combat is very cinematic and with quite high combat, uh, high damage numbers. And the, uh, it's got a sort of interesting freeform sorcery system. It has political allegiances where you can uh, lead or manipulate politics within the city to serve your own ends, even as other people do that against you. And uh, Emily, what am I forgetting? And tell us about the setting a little bit. So uh, the setting is the city of Eversink. It's a, sort of a late Renaissance, early modern city that's on a lagoon. Uh, it's really cool is that um, this city has uh, its own goddess, um, Denari, the goddess of civilization and commerce. And the city is literally her body. And all the buildings in the city are sinking all the time. So that makes the city into this interesting three-dimensional object where you, there's the city that you see above ground and then there's the miles and miles of city that is below ground. The city's been there sinking for about a thousand years, so there's an opportunity for adventure underground and above ground. Uh, we have all kinds of city districts to, for any kind of play, from political play to thief to more uh, the the gutter snakes who are trying to make it on the main streets uh, to the very rich people that whose houses you can uh, raid to everything in between. So um, it's a very flexible setting. Uh, you can put Ankh Morpork in it. You can play Liza Lock Lamora in it, uh, or um, you could just use the setting as it comes out of the box. Oh, 
or I can tell you it's awesome. You should get it. <laughs> <laughs> so to, give, to give you the kind of feel of what sort of a game might feel like, in a recent game when we were playing at home, uh, the heroes in my group accidentally killed one of the 13 secret rulers of the city. Uh, and then in the next game, we're hired to solve the murder because uh, one of the person's allies had used the prophecy ability in order to find out who in the city was most likely able to solve this murder. And quite correctly, connected that to the heroes, not realizing it was the heroes who committed the murder in the first place. Uh, so if um, sort of Fafford and the Grey Mouser-esque, Lankmar-esque, um, heroic, uh, heroic swords and sorceries your thing, you might enjoy it. Um, so we have a, a question about uh, crossing the streams here. Uh, uh, how hard would it be to uh, adapt uh, Gar's uh, fantasy novel uh, world to Swords of the Serpentine? It would be ridiculously easy, and it is a secret plan of mine to run a game of this for Gar at a future Gen Con when we are both in the same place. That would be weird, but it would, interesting. It'd be good. Oh, we need to, we actually have rules written for non-human uh, player characters, but they haven't made it in print yet. That'll go into a supplement is my expectation. And so we'll just uh, use those for the Taliban and what have you and uh, do some interesting things. Uh, so Kat, what else is on the horizon for Pelgrane that someone can tell us about? Um, so we have, um, we've actually, oh gosh, did I send that? I didn't send the invite link to JM. Um, I should probably have done that. We have got, thanks to uh, JM and Trisha DeFogey, who have stepped in to help Rob Hainsu out with um, 13th Age production and development, um, we have really started to ratchet up the 13th Age, um, basically the range of products available. So there's a load of stuff both out right now, like Book of the Underworld, and soon to be coming out. Uh, so do you want to jump down let's, to Rob let, for let's, that? Let's throw, let's, let, let's Hold on, it sounds like an angry raccoon has joined uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, panel here. Uh, so Rob, do you want to uh, tell us what uh, is uh, both uh, freshly out and in development for 13th Age? Anyone want to unmute Rob? Yep, trying. There we go. Good, great. Um, I'll start with the future and work back to now. So that's, you know, not usually the way we do it. Um, it's really good to have a team. I think uh, it, was, it was not working all that well for me to be a line developer and editing books and doing art direction and sometimes writing them and, and et cetera. And so um, I don't think I realized that we were, um, that we were getting a, a, a wife and husband team. But um, J.M. DeFogey has been doing the iconic podcast for a long time and uh, is a lot of fun to work with. And Trisha DeFogey is an awesome editor. And the two of them combine really, really well. And as a result, we've got um, multiple books coming out. I think the ones that are strangest and the ones that uh, people in the audience are most likely to um, write for someday um, are the Mosaic books. And because we're getting a whole bunch of new authors since the, mo the idea of the Mosaic books um, is that instead of me being sort of a gatekeeper of the very small amount of backstory that the 13th Age world has, we're just saying, look, the stuff that's in the Mosaic books is what the authors most want to write that's really cool, and it's not necessarily even going to um, synchronize with what the other authors of the book write. And uh, the first one is Dragon Hall City of Monsters, and I think JM is assigning art probably next week um, for that one. So it's well on the way. And the book after that is about the Koru behemoths. And we're gonna do more of those. Um, there's a couple books that I, I think I've mentioned them, but I haven't really uh, announced them. So I think maybe I could, but I'm, I'm gonna wait on those um, probably just because uh, there are things that I'm writing more and that means they'll be slower. Um, there is a book that I'm writing called Icon Followers, and uh, people always ask for more NPCs and um, that were sort of the type of people that you would find in the Dragon Empire instead of monsters. And uh, I'm working on that one and doing all, kind of doing weird systems like, why aren't the NPCs using the magic items that you're about to, learn, to get from them 
um, against you. And they really should be. And here's how to do that. And sort of adding systems to the game that are fun, as well as, as doing um, a lot of interesting um, monster style NPCs and write ups. And uh, there's about one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six books that are actually steaming towards completion. It's always a terrible idea for me to say, oh, and they'll be done at this time. But Elven Towers is actually going to lay out um, probably, what is today, the first? So it'll be, as, basically, as soon as Kat finishes Gen Con Online and wants to make a decision about who's going to lay it out, that's going to lay out. Um, and there will be um, a first level PDF um, by Wade, um, also coming out, I think, soon, but I'm not entirely positive. Uh, Dragon Hall will probably be finished with editing in a month and a half or two, or two months, would be my guess. Um, it could be, could be less. And so basically, 13th Age, I think people could be forgiven for thinking that uh, its publishing schedule was extremely slow, but thanks to new additions, there's lots of stuff coming pretty soon. Um, and I also will be happy to hear suggestions for people for what they want to see as subjects of mosaic books. I think we started strong with Draken Hall, City of Monsters, and then the Koru Behemoths, and I want to go ahead and keep, keep it strong. So, you know, when people have good ideas on that, let us know. Uh, so we haven't heard from uh, Ken yet, and uh, we, uh, I think the thing that, the main thing that's in the pipeline uh, from you and from Gar is the Borellis connection, uh, the so far sole supplement that is contractually uh, permitted for Fall of Delta Green. Uh, why don't you tell us uh, about that and uh, we can get a sense of where that is in the pipeline. Um, yeah, the Borellis Connection is a campaign uh, set uh, to the extent anything is ever set anywhere. It's set in early 1968, uh, right as the uh, Federal Bureau of Narcotics is coming apart in a series of corruption investigations and being replaced with the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs that will eventually become the DEA. Uh, and in that bureaucratic confusion steps Delta Green, uh, sending you the agents on a series of operations eerily paralleling the French connection heroin trail. And uh, if you think that uh, Gar and I have both watched an awful lot of Friedkin in the course of this, you're not wrong. Uh, so it, it's a globe trotter. It uh, takes you uh, from uh, uh, Laos and Saigon. Uh, there's um, uh, uh, something in uh, Beirut. There's an adventure in Turkey that's an old fashioned haunted mound, Call of Cthulhu. Shout out to Colin Wilson. There's uh, an advent, an urban adventures in Munich and in um, uh, Marseille. It's 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 a big it's a it's a big book and it was in fact impractically impracticably big. So uh, uh, Gar, too big. You might say, or you might say, so big that the heart despaired. But either way, um, uh, uh, Gar uh, from my outline. Uh, blew up the, the adventures and added wonderful uh, garnets to them and uh, wrote uh, the majority of the book. I did one of the operations and uh, then calved it back to barely publishable, which is the size we were aiming for, I guess, all along. And then uh, it sh it's in layout, right? Isn't it? Um, yes. Right. So it will be out soon-ish, maybe. Sure. Probably, I would say probably early 2021. Yeah. Would be my guess and then for it, along with that, a lot of it. Right. And then along with that, there will be uh, my uh, Looking Glass Saigon, which is no longer in the pages of the book because it's too big. Or is it still in the book? Gar? Oh, he's. Are you, are you pointing to me? He's okay. muted. I, um, Sorry, I, I, I to mute myself because of the small child yelling somewhere. I didn't want to. Realize that. Um, I think we took we put we took Saigon out or the Looking Glass part, but I wouldn't swear to it. It's been right. a while. It I was also, a very very. I also thought that. Yeah. 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 I think I, I wrote a a, a a guide to running uh, uh, adventures in Saigon in 1968 in the Nice Black Agents Looking Glass format. 
Uh, and as I mentioned, the book was impracticably long. So it will probably be coming out as a PDF around the same time the book does. So that'll be, uh, uh, that'll be the Borellis connection. And I'm sure that uh, Gar has even more thoughts. Yeah, it is, as Ken said, a gigantic globe trotting campaign. Um, you bounce through a lot, all the ventures are very different. Um, there's like, you know, Action Vietnam. There is a really odd one where basically it takes place entirely on the on a flight from um, Hong Kong to Los Angeles. So stopping along the way in various airports, which is a lot of like you know great fun with 1960s air travel. Um, there, yeah, it, it is a really hopefully great campaign. And as we have made clear, it's very very big, as in bigger than the core book big. Yes. And uh, that's because uh, when it turns out your agents uh, have the power of the federal government behind them, potentially, there's a lot of things they can do. So their decision trees are much broader than even in Knights Black Agents. So the average fall of Delta Green adventure, I think is, it may be the longest standard adventure type in Gumshoe. Well, not, they turned out longer than we thought they would, each individual one. Yours, yours certainly did. Yours, you know, well, mine, mine was always going to be the long one, because it was literally Saigon as a dungeon crawl, fundamentally. Yeah. And the other so, thing is, because so many of the characters in there are historical characters, Yeah, um, there's quite a lot like, you know, so, just so you understand this person, <laughs> here is the like, you know, very cut down but still extensive bio of who this person is, how they fit into the uh, context and brackets why they're involved with the mythos. It's uh, that's the whole that's the whole fun of doing uh, the Delta Green is you get to meet and ideally shoot in the head historical characters. The way the Murphy shot in the head, just magical. Don't shoot them in the head. Do not shoot General Lansdale in the head. Okay. Um, I guess at this point we can talk about uh, what's in the uh, hopper for uh, the Yellow King role playing game. Uh, the uh, next item on the agenda. You can already get the uh, pre-layout uh, text of it if you pre-order is Black Star Magic. Uh, this is the, uh, as, it's, as the title might suggest, the uh, magic source book for uh, the game. And uh, if you're familiar with the shock and injury cards in a uh, Yellow King role-playing game, guess what? Every spell is a shock card. Uh, so in, cor in order to work uh, magic, because guess what? Magic's always a bad thing. And uh, you're uh, putting yourself uh, in the crosshairs of Carcosa by learning how to uh, uh, manipulate supernatural powers because that's where all uh, paranormal ability flows from in all four of the different settings. Uh, in the settings, uh, each of them has a, a different uh, feeling uh, to them. Uh, the uh, uh, Paris magic feels like the occultism of that period. Uh, the uh, magic in the wars is uh, the, the yellow science. Uh, it is the attempt of uh, military operations on both sides to uh, weaponize and systematize magic in order to uh, uh, win uh, the war and, and uh, break the deadlock. But of course, both sides have magic. So it just contributes to the deadlock. Uh, then we move along to parageometry, the uh, uh, paranormal abilities of the uh, sinister uh, now uh, uh, overthrown regime, uh, but people still know how to use them and they, the archives are, have been captured, but you may have access to them. And then finally, uh, you get to the weird sort of meme, uh, dark internet uh, magic uh, found uh, in, the, in the, our present day of uh, This Is Normal Now. Uh, there is a, a scenario uh, for each of the four sequences that uh, somehow revolves around uh, a magic. So there's uh, one uh, set in, in Paris with a uh, revolving around a, a sinister cabaret. Uh, the uh, one, uh, and that is by uh, Sarah Saltiel. Uh, the, uh, uh, she also did the uh, This Is Normal Now scenario, which is uh, about magic being used in the background of a reality uh, TV dating show. Uh, there is uh, also uh, a brilliant uh, scenario by Ruth Tillman that uses the the dream clown uh, that you will recognize as a uh, the regime's favorite children's uh, TV character uh, uh, from Aftermath. 
Uh, and then uh, the, the one from the wars is called uh, Casket et Latil, and that is by Gar. So why don't you briefly uh, tell people about that, Gar? Um, that one, you're correctly, you're sent in to evacuate the village before it is um, bombarded. Um, and who there don't want to leave. So you've got to basically work out why they're trying to hang around and then encourage them to get out before the artillery bombardment starts. Which I think would be an easy thing, but it's not. Um, after that in the pipeline uh, in, uh, uh, is the uh, Yellow King Bestiary that's in uh, pre-production. -pre uh, and uh, they'll, I have a little bit of document wrangling to do to assemble the material from all of the various contributing uh, writers. And then that'll be uh, moving along to uh, uh, along the pipeline. And then, uh, do we want to talk about the uh, the research hole that Ken has gone down that, that in some future distant year might might produce uh, his take on the Yellow King? I'm I've already teased it. So. Let's do that. Yeah, right. Exactly. Now that, yeah. now that you've brought it up, <laughs> we might as well. Um, yeah, it's uh, called San Francisco 1912. It's a sequel to Paris and that it's meant to be played by your Paris investigators uh, getting together for one last job after they were all middle-aged and middle-class and uh, have put their youth behind them, or so they think, because they are drawn to the Carcosan involvement in uh, and around uh, the uh, decadent community of San Francisco, specifically the decadent community of Ambrose Bierce, Jack London, and a young whippersnapper named Clark Ashton Smith, who's just come to town with a heart full of dreams and a head full of poetry. Uh, and you will be involved in uh, potentially any number of San Francisco based adventures. That's kind of up to you, but the included sort of uh, adventure will take place uh, on or around the uh, California, uh, the elections of 1912, when you will get to sh uh, shift California to uh, President Winthrop, uh, uh, the, the candidate Harold Winthrop, uh, or against him, uh, to uh, Teddy Roosevelt, or in the current draft, still Woodrow Wilson, but I'm desperately looking for a version of this game in which Woodrow Wilson is not the good answer. So, <laughs> we, will, we will see what we will see. It, if, I, if I feel like playing up the bleak horror of it, yes, Woodrow Wilson is literally your best alternative. But, um, uh, We'll see what happens. Either way, um, it's uh, it, it's a lot of fun because that whole environment is full of uh, well, it's full of Clark Ashton Smith for one thing, but it's full of a lot of uh, weird self-involved artists and mystical ceremonies in uh, owl-studded groves. So it has plenty of Carcosan quality to it, as does San Francisco. If anyone's ever been to San Francisco, they know that it is probably tangent. Uh, to Carcosa in another way, and conveniently, it was the Paris of the West. So all manner of good stuff is happening in San Francisco, and I'm uh, digging through it now uh, to see what looks yellow in a certain light. Uh, so we've uh, had a question uh, 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 sent our way by someone who could not attend, and uh, I think this is one of those ones that is a uh, suggestion for a thing that people want in the form of a question. Uh, Daniel Fiddleman asks, uh, what would be the direction of the next Black a Knights Black Agents campaign? Is there a plan for a series of regional source books covering monsters, agencies, NPCs, and conspiracies in such places as the Middle East, South America, and Africa? Uh, Kat and Ken, what's up for Knights Black Agents, and does it sound like that at all? Um, that's a really good question. I don't, um, Gar, are you doing the locations book? I mean, theoretically, it's on, it's on the list, but like, you know, the, the list, this list is long and... It's a long list, right. I know, yeah, okay. I mean, my sort of concern about NDA at the moment is that, like, you know, we did Dracula dossier, so we, we did um, Zosny, and which starts off in uh, the Ukraine, or in um, Crimea, and that got, like, you know, complicated. And then we did Dracula dossier, set in England, which then was part of the EU. And that got complicated. And then we have the Persephone Extraction, which is a campaign about a global pandemic. And that got complicated. So I'm kind of worried 
about doing another source book? That might, you know, end the world? Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it, we, we have been um, quite prescient, worryingly. So, um, so I think the, the, so yeah, the, the, the book of thoroughly lovely vampires who aren't at all offensive. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Vampire petting zoo, what can go wrong? <laughs> The book uh, where do, the vampires come in and fix everything. Do not pet, do not pet the vampires. Um, yeah, the what the the regional book that I've always wanted to do is uh, the Pacific because uh, with Korea basically doing all the good spy films now, uh, you've got a whole new tradition of spy thrillers that kind of needs a look in. And obviously, China is the great global uh, rising uh, for our, for our new Cold War because the last one was so great. Uh, China's the bad guys in the, in the new one, uh, as well as uh, uh, giving us plenty of opportunity to be horrifically prescient if we want to. Uh, so I've, I've thought that that's probably, if we do another region book, that'll be the next one, is just the Pacific uh, uh, Theater. And we've carefully gone around hopping vampires, I think, in published NBA books. So we have a, a strong center to talk about uh, Chinese uh, vampire uh, tradition that we have not really uh, addressed with the exception of the Zhengui in um, uh, in Dracula dossier. So that would be a, a, a fun a fun book to do and I think it depends on Gar's resources and my time as do many of the things we yes. depend on. Um, the next uh, uh, gumshoe line that we haven't addressed uh, is uh, kind of the flagship one, Trail of Cthulhu. And uh, uh, Kat, do you want to uh, uh, tell us a little bit about what's in the pipeline uh, for Trail while unmuting Phil so he can talk about his thing? Um, yeah, so, so Phil's thing, she says, trying to unmute him. This always takes a while. Um, is Phil is currently working on um, the Lunar Society, which is going to be kind of a Georgian era, um, England focused Trail of Cthulhu setting. So Phil, do you want to jump in and tell everyone about the Lunar Society? Okay. Am I unmuted okay? Yep. Okay, yeah. Um, the Lunar Society book, yes. Um, it's, uh, I was researching something else and I ran across the Lunar Society and I decided they needed to be well, it was my, my opportunity to, to, to do some Trail of Cthulhu because they kind of fitted. Um, it's the 18th century. Um, it's, it occurred to me that this is actually the correct time to set, set, set Lovecraft in fiction because all of the stuff that Lovecraft worried about and got all panicky about, like deep time and the size of the universe and so on, was actually discovered 150 years before him. He just hadn't been put, just, just, he only just noticed it. And so you push it back there and you also get what Ken calls backlot gothic, which is to say a lot of little villages full of nerdling, um, nerdling villagers and, 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 and squires in um, frock coats, uh, well, not frock coats, sorry, whatever the 18th century term is, um, and uh, fog and mist and mysterious people coming out of the mist who might be deep ones or who might just be smugglers. And will cheerfully shoot you out, and will cheerfully kill you for looking at them either way. And the Lunar Society are the people who you get to uh, be your bosses, your, your sponsors, I should say, because they are people who are, who have, well, I should explain, they are a friendly group, dining group of uh, small time businessmen, local doctors, and so on in Birmingham with names like uh, Josiah Wedgwood, Erasmus Darwin, James Watt. Uh, Matthew Bolton, um, Priestley, you know, just names people might have heard, I don't know. Um, and they are people who will hear about strange things going on and have all sorts of interesting connections, but who are not actually directly connected to the government and indeed are often disapproved of by the government. So they will give you enough money to take a coach somewhere across, across England and investigate this weird thing that is happening in a, in a, in a little village somewhere on the coast. But you then have to fix it yourselves because um, they don't have the, they, they can't persuade the government to send the army in or anything. And um, so this, this, this came together as a, a, as far as I could see, very logical Trail of Cthulhu alternative setting, period setting thing. Um, and uh, I believe Kat is getting, getting somebody else to expand it a little even. So 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so kind of looking at the Lunar Society, um, it's, um, it's also often called the Lunar Men. Um, and there was a reason for that because it was all dudes all the time. And that was, <laughs> I didn't like the sound of that very much. Um, so Sarah Baltiel, who um, we know from The Yellow King, um, is currently working on doing a kind of a companion piece to that, um, which deals with the Blue Stocking Society. Um, so that kind of was, um, oh gosh, I'm going to show myself up now. I bet Ken or Robin could speak about the Blue Stocking Society considerably better than I could. Um, but it was uh, basically a kind of an intellectual um, salon um, in, uh, I think, the UK and France. Um, at around the same time period as the Lunar Society were in Birmingham. Um, so we're going to look at maybe putting both of those together. We originally spoke to Phil about um, doing the Lunar Society as a, a digital only product, um, but now we might put both of those together and print them as a book, is the, is the current thinking on that. Um, so yes, and I've just seen um, there's a question about Trail of Cthulhu 2nd edition, um, which is uh, something that if we had had our usual Belgrade um, summit at Dencon, um, we would almost certainly have spoken about it. Um, going let's, let's then, yeah, let's, let's go to two hounds <laughs> first. So there is a lot of people. Um, including Ken and me and probably everyone else on the Pelgrane team would really, really love uh, to see an expanded version of um, Ken's Tomb Hounds of Egypt, um, which was one of the original issues of Ken Wright's about stuff. Um, and we would love Emily Lesnar to do it because she's amazing and we think her knowledge of Egyptology would make her a perfect fit for that. And we've been trying to persuade her to do it for ages. So maybe this is the place, with all of us here together, if we all just wait hard enough. Maybe That's we right. Can, maybe like, we can... Uh... Like clapping your hands to bring Tinkerbell back to life. <laughs> we'll clap our hands and bring Emily back to Egypt. Similar effect. Trying to get yeah. me out of trying to get me out of Eversink and move back to move back to Egypt. <laughs> as yeah. as I have everywhere and always taught Emily, Earth is the only actual fantasy world. Everywhere else is a waste of valuable time. Emily, I will point out that you've already written for your fifty thousand words that are gonna go into a supplement. So that probably frees you up for two pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and if a certified mapologist says you have free time. <laughs> oh, We'll talk about it later. <laughs> so yeah, so we're we're gonna keep we're gonna keep working on Ariel. We we would we would really really love for this to happen. Yeah, so I would, so yeah. I would I would love to work on I would love to work on a trail of Cthulhu supplement that was Egypt based. That'd be amazing. Yeah, that would be. That would be so so uh, watch the space. So Kat, before we move on to uh, the uh, uh, world of electronic gaming. Uh, are there other uh, trail uh, things that we want to tease, or are we ready to uh, to go? That that sounds like you're thinking about a particular thing. Um, I'm not. I just want to make sure that we uh, have covered trail. No, I think yeah, I think okay. we've I think we've covered it. I, like I said, oh, the trail second edition. Yeah, sorry, it was was something that is. We we are still we are still talking about it. It is still in theory on probably Gar's um, very very long list of things that he's going to write with um, a lot of input yeah. from Ken. It's it's mere it's mere Ken and yeah. or me and Gar. Yep. Best way to do it. It's also true. Um, so uh, let's uh, move along to uh, Stephen Hammond. Uh, if we can have Stephen unmuted, he can tell us what's up uh, with the Black Book, which of course is an indispensable uh, online uh, gumshoe tool. All right, am I unmuted? Suitable? There you are. Excellent. Uh, as as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, version two of the Black Book is launching tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, the Black Book is the official sort of gum tool, gum shoe digital tools. Uh, the character tool has actually been live for a couple of years now. Um, the Game Master tools have been in beta for a while, and uh, we learned a ton from that beta. 
uh, and uh, uh, that's what's launching tomorrow. Uh, the GM tools include uh, a live uh, character matrix. If you've seen in the back of any of the gumshoe books, there's a little sheet where you can have your characters as a column for each one with their abilities and so forth. This is that, but digital and live. So you can see pools and ratings and as they change over time. Uh, we also highlight uh, recent spends in, in yellow so you can see who's been getting spotlight time and who hasn't. Um, you can view and edit uh, character sheets directly. It turns out a lot of GMs actually take responsibility for maintaining player character sheets. So we've provided for that. Uh, our number one feature request has been integration with other things. So we are launching Discord integration tomorrow. Um, you can connect your campaign to a Discord server. Uh, when a player makes a spend or rolls dice, that will get reported in the server. You can also ask on the server for a description of the character or to see their portrait or what their health status is and, and so forth. Um, a few people have been using it over the last couple weeks. It seems to be working pretty well. More will be coming there. Uh, uh, player tools have gotten a lot of polish and bug fixes. Uh, we added pronoun support. Uh, for your preferred pronouns, because Discord refers to the character rolled their dice or whatever, so we wanted that to be appropriate. Uh, the big question everybody's had for a while is, is pricing for the GM tools. Uh, so basic character creation is free and will remain free. If you want to use the tool as a player at the table, uh, that will remain $14.95 per year. Um, so you get access to track your spends and, and so forth at the table. Uh, the GM tools access is $29.95 per year, uh, and your players can connect to your campaign for free and use play mode while you are logged into your campaign and play. Um, uh, in our roadmap, uh, August, we'll, we'll see the launch of QuickShock, uh, GM's distributing cards to players finally. Uh, also, Swords and Serpentine support. Uh, September, we'll have more Discord features coming. Uh, Mutant City Blues, I hope that the, the diagram is hard. Uh, it, it'll be awesome, but it's hard. Uh, hopefully, Esoteris will appear somewhere in there. Uh, and uh, uh, tomorrow night to launch, uh, we're having a launch party, uh, 6 p.m. You can find it in the Gen Con event list is the Black Book V2 launch. Uh, because we're all virtual, we couldn't sort of get together for a toast. So we've gotten uh, somebody from the Rhode Island Historical Society is going to give us a virtual version of their Lovecraft walking tour. Um, and we'll all pretend we're walking around Providence, Rhode Island together. Uh, for 45 minutes, we'll uh, give a brief bit of info about the tool. Uh, a couple of really great giveaways. Uh, we're giving away a tablet so you can use to use the black book at the table. Uh, and uh, I think that's the speed version. Uh, during Gen Con, uh, you can use a discount. Uh, Gen Con 2020 is a discount code for 10% off one year. Uh, if you come to the event tomorrow, we'll be giving away a 20% discount code for anybody who makes it to the uh, launch party tomorrow night, 6 p.m. I uh, hope to see you there. So, so Steve, the full price for year is? is uh, $29.95 for the GM tools for a year. And that gets you everything. Right. Uh, and uh, we have a question, which I think you've implicitly answered by giving away a tablet, which is how is the player mobile support? Uh, we, are, we fully support mobile devices, tablets, phones. Um, uh, the player tools have the ability to filter out uh, the abilities that your character doesn't have. So if you haven't put any points in flirting, then that won't appear uh, when you're in play mode. So everything collapses down nice and small and easy to find uh, on a phone works great. Uh, GM tools, uh, you really want a, a tablet or bigger. Uh, the matrices and stuff just do not function well on a phone. Uh, but the player tools, tablet, phone support, uh, it, it's fully responsive in there. Um, so, uh, while we're on the subject of uh, playing online and integrating with uh, things like uh, Discord, uh, Noah Lloyd uh, has uh, a roundup of information about uh, new ways to play Gumshoe uh, online. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Noah. Um, you just heard Stephen talking about the Black Book, which is definitely kind of the best gumshoe specific um, uh, digital GM helper that you can get. I have kind of been working on as many different little nooks here and there in the virtual tabletop space, just trying to um, get Pelgrane involved as much as possible. Um, so the newest platform we're supporting is Astral Tabletop which is kind of a newcomer, but has uh, seemed to be really popular with folks lately. I've been building character sheets for it. So we've got four gumshoe character sheets at the moment, Time Watch, Trail of Cthulhu, Yellow King, and Knights Black Agents. Uh, we will hopefully have a working 13th Age sheet up soon. Um, I've been working on it, and I know that there's a community member who's been working on one as well. Um, and then I've been trying to put some map packs together just in the the earliest stages of that, both for Astral and for Roll20. Over on Roll20, we've still got three adventures there for 13th Age, one of which is free, and we just released Midnight Subrosa, which is an adventure for Trail of Cthulhu out of the Out of the Woods collection. Uh, I have an idea about how to make the Book of Unremitting Horror available for Roll20 in kind of a fun way, but again, that's uh, waiting till after Gen Con before really uh, embarking on that. Um, for Fantasy Grounds, this is something I'm excited about. I've been working with a community coder to put together a Gumshoe SRD rule set, basically, that would be official and um, would have everything in the Gumshoe SRD that you would need to, to put a game together. And from there, we'll start building out extensions into some of the other systems, like Knights Black Agents, Ezo Terrorists, that kind of thing. Um, Fantasy Grounds also has some community 13th Age assets that look really kind of tremendously done that you should definitely check out. And then the last thing I wanted to plug is the Gumshoe Community Content Contest we have running right now. So if you don't know what the Gumshoe Community Program is, it's through DriveThruRPG and it's somewhere that you can upload um, your own creations for Gumshoe systems onto DriveThruRPG for sale or for free. and uh, we're currently for supporting four systems for that. Ashen Stars, Esoterrorists, Second Edition, Fear Itself, Second Edition, and Time Watch. Um, so the contest, the way the contest works is you write up something that you're interested in. It could be a new monster for Fear Itself. It could be a full-fledged scenario, uh, whatever idea you have. So if you have something homebrew that you wrote up years ago, put some polish on it and submit it. Robin is going to judge them. And then one winner will have their product professionally laid out by Jen McCleary and have the cover done by Jerome. Uh, everybody who submits something, so you know, if you're like, yeah, I probably won't win, submit something anyway, because anybody who submits gets a free eight and a half by 11 art print of the cover of the line that they submit to. So if you write something for Ashen Stars, you'll get a, an art print of the Ashen Stars cover, which is pretty cool. Um, Oh, I will drop the link to that announcement right here. There's just a Google form there. Uh, oh, Kat just did it. Never mind. Look at Kat's post. Um, you can find all the information right there. And if you have questions about it, feel free to message me right on Discord. So uh, if we were in an, uh, a non-virtual event, uh, uh, people who are specialists in putting grommets on their cosplay uh, outfits would be giving us the side eye. I'm trying to urge us out of the room. Uh, but uh, uh, since we're not at real Gen Con, uh, we can uh, continue on. And, and uh, I think we've mostly hit all the points. Simon, do you have anything vaguely inspirational to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, sort of. Um, I haven't been involved this year, so it's quite nice to turn up at the panel and find out what you're all up to do. Um, <laughs> and I've also, uh, I've also been a player this year so i've been play testing things and watching things come out having not been involved with them at all and it's quite um it's quite a novel experience it's really nice to open up a finished uh Pelgrim book without having to have done any of, of the work it's really very very pleasant um uh i'm quite intrigued by uh honey and hot wax uh i'm gonna have a look at that because we haven't really uh, we've only published one LARPY book before, um, so that it, that certainly intrigues me. And I've been so now that you've mentioned it, you have to describe what it is because we haven't uh, talked about it yet. Um, it, I would describe it as a book of sexy LARPs. I think that's probably a fair way of of putting it. 
Um, some of them are the art games anthology is the is the the tagline. They're going more for like art and erotic rather than like sexy, but it's pretty sexy too. Yeah, yeah, uh, that was my initial take on it when reading it. And there are a couple of games in there that look to be really fun. Um, well, I've also been play testing things that are not likely to appear for a very long time, which is also really a lot of fun to do. Um, and yeah, just watching watching it all happen without me, it seems um, it's wonderful, really. Uh, uh, and I'm I'm glad that uh, the team and new members of the team are producing such amazing work. Uh, so at this point, I think we've uh, uh, given our various spiels. Uh, and uh, but before we adjourn, if anyone has a question that we haven't addressed, uh, please pop that into the chat and uh, we'll uh, try to uh, uh, quickly hit that now. Um, so this was one thing that we haven't um, touched on yet that kind of uh, ties into, well, I guess it, there's, there's kind of two elements to it. Um, but a lot of people have very kindly pointed out that we're having some, um, the people are getting security warnings on the on our website when they go on to it. Um, so this is basically because our TLS or SSL or something is um, not, has not been updated to the latest version. Um, so we, we are trying to speak to our um, old webmaster on that, um, but we've actually got somebody working on a new website for us. Um, so we're hoping to launch that probably in the next month or two. Um, so when we do launch it, we're going to need people to like come in and beta test the, the ever living hell out of it. Um, so we'll be posting, um, we'll be posting things about that, trying to recruit people to, it's effectively like a play test, only not quite as much fun. Um, come in and like just, <laughs> just bash away at the shop and at all of the, the various kind of components of that and just kind of let us know what you think. So we'll probably be reaching out to to you and to the, the people that, that we're closer to in the community to have a look at it before we release it to the, the world. But um, I'm really excited about it. I think it looks really cool. It looks like a really real grown up people's um, uh, website and it's got so much like funky shop uh, functionality. It's it just, yeah, I'm really excited about it. Um, yeah, so we've got that. Um, the As Noah mentioned about uh, the Gumshoe community uh, content program. So we're, we're still, we're still really trying to, the reason for the contest is that we really, really want people to take um, Gumshoe and to do community content things with it. Um, so probably coming up for that maybe is um, Gumshoe one-to-one -one further down the line. Um, and we're also, what else are we putting on there? We've got Esoterra, Spirit Off, um, Time Watch, and Ash and Stars at the moment, don't we? Yeah. So to possibly looking at opening that up for Meeting City Blues as well. Um, later and probably all of in the next kind of Gen Con to Gen Con year. Right. And all of uh, one to one is available through the open content license. So uh, yeah. there's no reason not to get started on your yeah. cool one to one idea. Uh, and, and and we do have a lot of people, we have a lot of people working on what are going to be digital one-to-one -one, um, products. So there are going to be like standalone PDFs with like a protagonist character and a um, protagonist character, an adventure and a kind of a mini setting. Um, so Noah's working on one of those, you know, Sarah Saltiel is working on one of them. Um, and we've got a couple of other people as well who are, who are just starting to work on those. Um, so we have some questions in the uh, in the sidebar. Uh, Tim Baker asks, there is talk of Gar working on a 13-page adventure featuring dragon PCs. Uh, in your vast swirl of possible things that you could be working on, Gar, where is that? Well, I was working on it, I called away to other things. This was all in the, like, you know, the before times, the previous era before COVID back in, like, you know, December was working on it. Um, yeah, Silence we playtesting it. The first four adventures I think are done. So the, basically it'd be, ten, it'd be a 10 adventure camp or 10 level campaign. So the adventure tier is done. And I've looked at it in months. It will get done at some point, but I have no idea where it will be slotted back in on my schedule given 30th Age has lots of stuff going on and there are many other uh, things I need to be working on. So ask Kat, whenever she says, guard do that, I will go and do that. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, it, was, been... it was one of the things that, that um, Simon, when he was talking, he was kind of going, and I've been playtesting things that maybe, <laughs> maybe we want to talk about so that then we can bump it up in Gar's list. And I'm like, no. <laughs> no. Um, Gar is doing other gumshoe things that we, have we announced those yet? I don't know. We have, a think, in some forms. The Gumshoe one to one fantasy and so forth. Does that sound familiar to you all? Absolutely. Yeah. I think we might have spilled the beans on that last uh, year at this panel. Oh, no, really? Oh. I or, hate it when that happens. <laughs> or, or, or possibly in the, um, like, you know, Pelgrane chats we were doing back when things started off. Yeah, yeah, that might have been it. That is ongoing. It, um, mm -hmm. it is nearly ish done, I oh. say, uh, aware that certain adventures will drag on forever. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. We, we, we've concerned, we, we, we have con confirmation that Gar has, has previously spilled the, the beans on this at some okay, video cool. chat point. Yeah. Um, so, Simon, what kind of dragon are you playing? I think he's actually. Um, yes, I, I've. I have asked him to beg um, his other business partner um, to come in and try <laughs> see if he can fix the website. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so so we're trying to pull uh, strings and favors um, at the moment. So Simon has has bravely abandoned us to go off and, uh, and, and see, if, run up see if he can if he can pull in a lifetime's worth of favors with um uh, yeah with his other business partner. Um. So. Uh, this uh, brings to mind the fact that there is an exciting Pelgrane deal on at this very moment, Kat, that is of yeah. great delight to you, which yeah. is the Dying Earth Bundle of Holding. Uh, <laughs> someone has very kindly put that a link to that already. Uh, yeah. this, is, this is the game that just just won't go away because everyone loves it so much and they can't stop buying it. When we it just it keeps dying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Over and over again, it dies. We kill it. It's we like put the it last down. act of an opera. It gets it gets knocked down and it gets up again. We ain't never gonna keep it down. Um, but yes, um, the Dying Earth RPG, the complete line. So every single um, every single product that we did for the Dying Earth um, is currently available in the bundle of holding. Um, and I think it was Steve Dempsey has hopefully posted a link um, in the chat about that. Um, I will maybe just repost it there again. Um, so yeah, so you can get the complete um, Dying Earth PDF bundles um, on the bundle of holding for the next, I think it's three weeks. Um, and I'm, I'll maybe let Robin and or Steve Dempsey uh, chat about that. Um, but something that you might have noticed is at the same time as part of the website upgrade, um, Noah has been reposting a lot of our classic Dying Earth content. Um, so, ooh, um, so he actually recently discovered, and this is fascinating for me because the Dying Earth was all kind of before before my time um, at Pellegrin. So he recently found an amazing choose your own adventure um, that some people wrote up for the Dying Earth. So we just posted that on our website, but there's like so much amazing content in there that I've just never seen. So yeah, um, so go check out the website, check out the most recent um, Dying Earth posts. And then if you like what you see, go grab the bundle. Uh, we have a question about the community content uh, program. Uh, Johan asks, uh, does it have to be for one of the games in the Gumshoe community content, or can you submit a new setting using the Gumshoe SRD? So the goal with it, um, the goal with it is to basically boost the community content available. So the idea is that basically everything that um, is submitted, we would actually put up on drive through um, make that available for sale to people, and the creators would get um, royalties on that as, as with all of the Gumshoe community um, work. So for that contest, it's specifically the existing community content pro existing community content properties. Uh, Mo Lane asks if there's a forum or site for people looking for Gumshoe GMs or players for playtests. And that would be the the gun the uh, the Pelgrin Discord. Uh, so we're begin. I think we're beginning to lose people to other commitments because we've run out uh, over time. Uh, so at this point, we are being kicked out by the cosplayers. And uh, in the meantime, you can uh, uh, head on over to the store and try and figure out which four things that you want to get the cheapest one uh, free. So thanks a lot, everybody, and uh, perhaps we'll see you later as part of Gen Con Online. Soon.
we will all disappear. We'll all be gone.